This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Fun. Okay, we're back. We're live. Hmm, my goodness, it's Monday. Woo! It's not. It's not the first show Monday. It's the second show Monday. It's a very important show. It's me and Marco and me on Mondays about energy. And Marco is on travel, so it's Mina and me on Monday about energy. Hi, Mina. Welcome back to the show, your show. <laughs> there you are. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. We have such interesting discussions. And so, uh, alone at last. <laughs> <laughs> How do we fill up this hour? <laughs> Let's talk about a couple of things today. I mean, we entitled this show uh, Planning Everywhere, but what about execution? Um, and that, that relates to, um, you know, infrastructure in Hawaii requires both planning and execution. But let's warm up and I'll tell you a little about our trip, our ThinkTech trip, uh, only last week uh, to Maui and um, uh, Molokai. And uh, I want to just raise one of the things that came up in Molokai. We're going to make OC16 movies about, we are making OC16 movies about both, both islands and what we saw and learned there. But one of the interesting things, which uh, you know, I know that uh, you follow, is this whole thing about entitlements. And so you have a, you have a project in Molokai. It's the Half Moon, Half Moon project, and it's a big uh, uh, solar and battery, you know, uh, high-tech battery installation. It was going on before um, with, uh, I think it was called Princeton Energy out of the West Coast, and. They, they didn't, uh, they, they couldn't finish it. I guess they had a little trouble with public acceptance, among other things, and, um, and they sold their position to Half Moon. Now Half Moon uh, is going to finish it. In fact, we had a show uh, two weeks ago with, um, I think his name was Mike Hastings, and he, he's the, uh, the CEO of the Half Moon company uh, that's supposed to do it. And while we were on um, Molokai on this trip, there was a lot of discussion about it, and one of the most interesting discussions was um, with a woman named Amelia. Uh, she has a Dutch last name, and she is the principal of Sustainable Molokai, and uh, they're in discussions with Half Moon, um, and they, they would like certain entitlements uh, for this project. They would like to have um, a percentage of stock of equity in the company, and they'd like to have a, a kind of royalty, talking about 1% off the top, as I understand it. Now this is this is really important, uh, you know, as a as a pace setting development. Um, it's not dissimilar from other similar negotiations and demands in the past. Uh, it's uh, you know, will you provide certain uh, entitlements, uh, quid pro quo, community benefits, sometimes millions of dollars of community benefits, and then I'll be your friend, and then I won't oppose your project. Um, there's something something that's a little chilling about that. And I think that approach has busted a lot of projects. And, and here it raises its head again. And maybe it'll work. Maybe they'll negotiate some solution um, where you know, the, the community, that is the sustainable Molokai community, uh, will get some, get some um, you know, stock or royalties or something out of this. And, and then mm -hmm. they will agree to it. But there are ripple effects. There are implications of this, uh, as there have been we've seen in the past in, in Lanai, about the wind in Lanai. We've seen it certainly in the TMT 30 meter telescope issue um, and other various other projects around the state where uh, activist groups who oppose the project would be willing um, to agree to the project if only you gave them a new gymnasium or maybe some kind of, you know, uh, monetary consideration. Your thoughts, Mina, please. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it all boils down to the power purchase agreement. And first of all, the power purchase agreement has to be um, a competitive pricing. So, so if they can um, give the utility uh, a competitive price while offering all of these um, benefits to the communities, good on them. But, you know, one shouldn't be looking at the power purchase agreement to subsidize these kinds of um, community entitlements or extractment, extractions or benefits or whatever you want to call them. So I think that's the main thing, that, that, the, um, that, that the power purchase agreement is competitive and not something that's subsidized. Then, you know, then, the, then the developer can do whatever he likes with his profits in, in, in sharing, sharing the developer side profits with the, um, 
it with the community. Um, so I, I, I think that's the main point that um, has to be looked at. Yeah, well, as if you know, if you were a queen for a day or a year, <laughs> and you had total control over this, um, would, would you prefer to be not, uh, would you prefer to outlaw to say, no, no, no. You want your purchase power agreement, that's fine, but you know, we don't want you uh, to promise um, activist groups, you know, because uh, they're not identical to the ratepayer or to the population, the electorate, yeah. if you will. They're just a group that, that can speak loudly and uh, make, 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 make public statements and all. Um, yeah. would, you, would you say, no, we don't want this, we're not going to permit you to do this, just give us the straight economics here? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's a really fine line between, you know, um, uh, working towards the overall benefit of the community and what may, could be, you know, I, I want to say blackmailing quotes that you can't even consider the project un unless you give us something. You know, and, and 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 to get our support. I mean, we have to be really careful about this. Um, you know, and especially if we're driving towards um, lower electricity prices for the community um, as a whole. You know, that's a larger benefit than you know trying to. Um, uh, grab a piece of the de developer's pie. I mean, so there's some really careful balancing that needs to go on here. I mean, somebody somebody pays, nothing's free, yeah. you know, and, but, you know, as a former regulator, what I want to make sure is the rate payers not paying for this. You know, already Molokai prices are being subsidized by the Maui rate payer. And, and you know, we want to move away from, um, um, subsidized rates to something more actual rates. So, so again, we need to be really, really careful in how we approach these kinds of discussions. Yeah, just a, just a thought about it is that um, if uh, you said this, um, that if you if you uh, add into the price of doing the cost of doing the project, the cost of these entitlements, well, then the cost of doing the project is greater. And then when I go to the utility for the um, purchase power agreement, or I go to the PUC for approval, I disclose I have to pay X millions, um, <laughs> you know, as uh, off the top, and it costs me more, and therefore my my rate has to be higher. And, and yeah. that's a legitimate statement. It's a legitimate argument. The the, the yeah. problem is that you're paying some people, and the result is you have a higher rate applying to all people. So a smaller group is benefiting, the larger group is paying for it. Uh, it mm -hmm. seems clear, the economics to me seem clear about that. Uh, yeah. And so the, either the utility Yeah, say, we, you know, especially for energy pricing and clean energy pricing, we need to move to a more um, economic-based model. And there was a time where the policy was we would subsidize clean energy, you know, and, and we did it through tax credits, we did it through some um, subsidized power purchase agreements. But, you know, the economics have changed. And what we really need is some relief for the rate pair right now. And, and so what we really should be focusing on is we want the most competitively priced clean energy projects available to us. Right, and, so this would be the me, wrong direction. Be focus. This would actually benefit. increase rates to the consumer, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just uh, wonder going forward, if, you, if we have this deal, which is a momentous deal, this is going to have a huge effect on Molokai. It's going to be a third or more of the power. That, that's, right now, Molokai is mostly uh, diesel. So, got yeah. a nice plant there, got a battery system, all that, but it's mostly diesel. Um, and, uh, if, you know, this will, this will change things in Molokai. It'll be a significant impact, if you will, to the energy picture on Molokai. Um, but it, uh, what troubles me is that if, if this happens, it will set a standard, don't you think? It will be um, sort of an approved methodology uh, where the community gets the entitlement, the extraction, if you will, uh, and then it goes forward on that basis. Um, uh, there'll be other projects where people might be inclined to oppose them, object to them. I mean, it's so easy to object these days. Um, yeah. And this is how you, you, you buy them off 
And so yeah. it could get to be de rigueur, you know? It could get to be the, the, the way things work all the time, the normal. Wouldn't, doesn't that yeah. concern you? Yeah, it does concern me, and that's why we need to be careful on how we approach these issues. Um, you know, and especially Molokai is a really special situation because right now they they have um, too much solar during the day and not enough demand. So you know, it's one of the reasons why um, batteries uh, appear to be attractive. Um, as a way to resolve some of these issues because they can only back those diesel generators down so much without compromising reliability. Yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, institutions like the um, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute and Hawaiian Electric are, are working in partnership to look at these kinds of um, technical um, challenges for, for Molokai right now. So in the basic problem, I you know, these numbers aren't, I haven't looked at them recently, but um, two years ago when I kind of looked at this issue, um, the net meter, net metering, the customers with net metering on Molokai accounted only for about 10% of the customer base. And, um, but they were causing the most impact to the grid, mm -hmm. you know, um, in, in jeopardizing, um, like I said, so much, you can only send back so much energy to the grid without jeopardizing um, reliability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you serve the other 90% of customers on Molokai without access to clean energy um, uh, without access to solar, um, yet making it uh, the the their electricity costs more more affordable for them, rather than increasing their costs. Yeah, that's especially so, relevant on Molokai because Molokai people are you know, economically a lot of people are economically disadvantaged. There's not a lot uh -huh. of jobs there. There's not a lot of money there. Not a lot of investment there. <clears throat> and so uh, we need to keep the prices as low as we can. From Molokai is one of the highest rates in the state, isn't it? Um, I think it's between uh, Molokai and Lanai. Mm. And and again, you know, the challenge of Molokai is you got you have a long island with uh, you know transmission from one end to the other end, and then you have some really small isolated communities like Kalaupapa. So the transmission and distribution is the bulk of the cost on Molokai, not so much generation, yeah. but um, yeah, it's, it's it, you know, the transmission distribution contributes to a lot to that high cost of uh, electricity on Molokai. Well, you know, more and more uh, we realize that the low hanging fruit in terms of moving to renewables uh, has been picked. And we realize that uh, we have to invent systems that to deal with the need for infrastructure. Um, we're, we're at a point where we have, we have technology that's coming down the pike that can help us. Um, we have demands that require um, new infrastructure. We have the complications, complexities of the grid going forward. And it's all about infrastructure. And that means it's all about investment. So we have to manage the investment, manage the infrastructure, and manage all the uh, purchase power agreements going forward in order to uh, resolve those problems and provide that infrastructure. And uh, we're going to take a short break, Mina Marita. Mina Marita is uh, the principal of Energy, Energy Dynamics, uh, former chair of the PUC. When we come back, Mina, I'd like to talk to you about infrastructure and how we deal with it, how we manage it, how we, how we obtain the capital for it in order to move ahead properly at this point in the, in the trajectory of our move to clean energy. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm RV Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone. And Think Tech is important to our community because it gives us a chance to learn more. We get to learn more, we get to give more, we get to grow more. Now for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can so that ThinkTech Hawaii can continue to 
to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and I look forward to yours. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website. Thanks for thinktech.causebox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, mahalo for your generosity. Okay, we're back, we're live with uh, Mina Morita here on Marco, Mina, Mina, Marco and me on Mondays about energy, and today it's Mina and me, and we're talking about our principal topic is planning, um, planning everywhere, but what about implementation and execution? Uh, what about, you know, and you, in order to have infrastructure, which we absolutely need for energy and so many other things in the state uh, and country, I might add, um, we have to have planning. You really can't do infrastructure. You can't deal with it as an asset, depreciate it, and replace it as an asset unless you have planning. And query, do we have the planning? And if we have the planning, how, how, um, how collaborative is that? Is it how coordinated is it? Or do we have 57 silos of planning, none of them talking to the other, um, where nothing ever gets done? So do we have the planning? Um, uh, well, what's, what's your thought about that, Mina Marita? Well, I think, you know, one of the most um, uh, one, one of the most how can, how can I describe it? Most un underestimated or under, undervalued, one of the most undervalued um, offices within our state government is Office of Planning, um, which at one time, especially during the um, Ariyoshi administration, handled coordination between departments and counties on a statewide basis. And um, there was some kind of Constitutional kerfuffle. <laughs> that, kerfuffle, right? <laughs> um, said that it was unconstitutional to have any type of uh, permanent offices in the gov under the governor's office. The so office of planning was moved to. Um, eventually, they they ended up in DBED, the uh -huh. Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Uh -huh. But over the years, they've been um, undervalued. And um, I remember, I think it was at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's um, Clean Energy Day, uh, the person speaking for Office of Planning said that the state's functional plans have not had a um, general update, a coordinated update since 1992. And so, you know, now with, you know, our our um, infrastructure aging and not only our electrical grid, but, you know, our water infrastructure, our telecom infrastructure, um, road systems, you know, one of the most important efforts that we can focus on is looking at um, our functional, our, our state functional plans and really updating, not all of these plans have been updated recently, but updating with a thought to um, how to coordinate our infrastructure to get the maximum benefits and how to incorporate issues like resiliency, adaptation, um, carbon um, reduction, um, greater efficiency, sustainability. Uh, so, so, you know, how, how, how do we look at the, uh, the, the intersection of all these issues while we're updating the functional plans? Yeah, I think intersection is a magic word because, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, acquainted with all the agencies in government that do planning. I imagine that most agencies do planning and they have their own little plan or big plan. So you have the state plan coming out of, I guess, the Office of Planning. Um, you have the uh, PSIP, 
that is the, what is it, the, uh, what does that stand for? It's part of the electric, um, part of the utilities. Um, it's the utilities. Integrated resource planning, so yeah. the power systems um, improvement plan. Yeah, power systems improvement plan, which is a major plan of hundreds, thousands of, of pages uh, provided to the PUC at its request. It, it took a while to put that together. It took a long mm -hmm. time to get a plan together. Now it's a plan that's been approved, but there's a lot of other agencies that have a lot, a lot of other plans. And, there's, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any agency that says, we're going to look at all the plans. We're going to somehow, we're going to integrate all the plans. Uh, we're going to find the common points. We're going to find the points of conflict. I'm going to work it out so there's one great big plan, and we're not moving down the wrong road here and the right road there. We're going to move down consistent roads and have a consistent integrated plan. Is there anybody, do you know if anybody is doing that, putting the plans together, Mina? Well, I think, you know, um, people always point to Oregon as and um, has in, having a, a, um, innovative um um, planning efforts there, and and uh, yeah, there, there there are areas that you can probably point to, but I think one is developing the mindset um, uh, within the agency, within the staff of all of these issues that are emerging that we should be focused on, and that planning should be done in. Uh, looking at um, how to get multiple benefits from certain actions rather than real linear thinking that, that you're going to build this project and this is going to happen. You know, we, we have to move away from that and, and think about it more as a system. And this is really important because um, we're about we're spending billions of dollars in upgrading our critical infrastructure. Um, you know, the electrical grid for one, our our telecommunication systems, uh, our fuel infrastructure with reinvestments in the refinery. M millions, hundreds of millions of dollars will be spent in these efforts. And the critical aspect of planning is. We need some certainty while we're making these kinds of investments. And Absolutely. The planning cannot be politically focused. Yeah. At the same time, you know, the plans have to evolve too, because the world plans, changes, the technology plans have changes. Plans evolve, and plans have to um, um, avoid the kind of political uh, uncertainties. Yeah. Yeah, because especially because if you're these an investor. big investments are going to be made. Right. If you're an investor, you need to have that that certainty. But let me yeah. let me let me move it to another another problem that I see. Um, so, and maybe this is because the, the various planning organizations and plans are in different different pukas, different silos. Um, it works this way, but there is there is very little uh, actual implementation of these plans. Um, what I mean is, um, you have a plan. And more than likely than not, it's it's uh, it's not even actually um, published. It it goes maybe around some government agencies, um, but there's not a lot of uh, transparency in it because it just winds up on a shelf. Uh, nobody takes it seriously, um, least of all the legislature, who may in the in the first analysis may have even asked for the plan, and now the legislature doesn't do doesn't implement the plan that it called for. Or a plan that's a very good plan, theoretically, um, that is worthy of implementation, but nothing happens. It goes on the shelf and gathers dust. And I think that's the public perception, too. You hear about the yeah. plans, you don't hear anything else. Well, and, and so I think that's why, you know, it's really important, you know, when you start looking at these um especially civil, civil service positions within our, our various agencies, that these are, you know, these are the professionals that you count on for execution. You know, these are the guys that are going to facilitate execution for the private sector. So, you know, how much we invest in, in these professionals, we should be keenly aware of. 
I, I think, you know, right now, um, you look at what's happening on the federal level and the, um, the uncertainty that's happening there, and especially with the, the agencies that regulate, regulate health and safety, you know, the key people that, have, that keep these organizations going, that do the planning, do the execution, um, that we rely on for our health and safety, you know, they're being disregarded. Mm. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is really the dismantling of, of um, you know, some some key agencies. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, this is kind of an aside. Um, uh, what's his name? Michael Lewis, who wrote um, Moneyball. Uh, he had an article recently, I think it was in Vanity Fair, about what's happening within the Department of Energy and uh, Department of Agriculture. I'm really concerned because, you know, within the Department of Agriculture, we in Hawaii rely a lot on the rural development funds. And, um, you know, systematically, those kinds of programs are being affected. Um, and, and, and those are the kinds of programs that do a lot of planning for, for uh, especially our rural communities yeah. in dealing with um, financing for critical infrastructure. Yeah, that raises the interesting question. You know, suppose you find, I mean, I'm not saying that's so here with the agriculture department, but <clears throat> suppose you find a, an agency or a program that, that should be uh, retired. Um, well, you don't do that ad hoc. You don't do it because you woke up one morning and, you know, figured out you didn't like it. Um, you do it according to a plan also. So you grow and you evolve and you change things all according to some kind of plan where you take into account other, the ripple effects and the way it affects other agencies and other parts of the government and the society. And un un unfortunately, in the federal government, in this administration, we're not doing anything like that. <clears throat> but likewise, in the state of Hawaii, we should be expanding, evolving, changing, improving, and also, in some cases, reducing government programs according to a plan. Some kind of a plan is generally agreed. So this all takes me <clears throat> to the fact that this conversation uh, between you and me is not in a vacuum, and that there are other people talking about this, particularly at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And in fact, there's a plan uh, to address this whole issue about infrastructure uh, and resilience and sustainability and energy and planning uh, and um, gee, I, inf you know, finding the funds for infrastructure and coming together on these things in the uh, legislative briefing scheduled for, I guess it's the first week of January in the Capitol Auditorium as, as we always have a program around that time to brief the legislature. Can you talk about that program and, and how it is uh, shaping up at this point? Well, I think we're still in the preliminary stages right now, but um, my understanding is that we are going to par partner, the, the forum is going to partner with Office of Planning in um, doing this briefing. So I hope, uh, you know, that we can get some really good um, provocative speakers to sort of just open up our minds as to the importance of this issue as we move forward to be a, um, to have effective governance. You know, and, and planning, is so key in resolving conflicts. Um, you know, if we all understand the objective that objectives and goals that we are trying to reach, you know, sometimes you can approach those objectives and goals from from different avenues. It doesn't have to be one road. And and so when you're able to do that, you can build the constituency over these kinds of common goals and objectives, even though the approach might be a little different. Um, but uh, I, I think that way you get bigger buy-in. So that's, that's another reason why planning is so important to help resolve conflicts. Yeah, this is a very important question and we've only touched on the very surface of it. There's all kinds of questions about how you do the planning and how you collaborate on the planning and how you avoid conflict between the agencies and and how you ultimately implement the planning. 
Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be a very worthwhile program. So everybody uh, pencil in the first week uh, in, uh, in January uh, for um, the legislative briefing by the YNG Policy Forum and the Office of Planning. Uh, that'll be a great program. Well, anyway, thank you, Mina Marita. It's, uh, it, it, I love covering provocative issues, and we've done that here today. So I look forward to seeing you again two weeks hence uh, for more discussion on uh, Mina Marco and me on Monday on energy and related issues. Thank you so much, Mina.